The world is a crazy place. And one of the craziest things you can have to do is to flee your country. Guys, I've had some questions on asylum. So today we're gonna break that down and explain the asylum and refugee process. I'm Andrew Esquire, this is A Legal Mindset, where we train your legal mind. Let's start, as always, with some background, with some history. I love me some history, guys, because asylum is something that goes back in time. It goes back to the era after World War II. And as we saw during World War II, people were persecuted for their race, for their religion for their national background. And that is something that the world did not want to see again. The world as a whole agreed that it is not fair that an individual, that a human being should be persecuted for who they are, for the person that they were born to be. They can't alter that. And therefore, they have a basic human right to protection. And if they can't find that protection within their own country, they were enabled to go to another country to seek refuge. That's the core of the word refugee. Asylum is the granting of sanctuary for that refugee, the protection of that refugee. So understand the basis of those words when we're talking about them. The concept of asylum and refugee status started in 1951 at the United Nations. You probably know the United Nations is a global organization which some of its edicts and orders aren't enforced. But one that has been agreed upon and has been enforced by almost every nation are the provisions regarding refugees. It was agreed by the UN that a refugee is a person who is being persecuted in their home country based on their race, national origin, religious, or membership in a particular group. This has been something that has been agreed upon and has functioned for the past decades. The question is today whether individuals are leaving their countries because of true persecution or simply because of economic conditions. And that's one of the factors that goes into the determination of whether or not to grant someone asylum status. Let's use the United States as a case study because some countries do administer their asylum policies in slightly different ways. It's permissible to be a little bit more liberal with your policies, while there are some hard limits on how conservative a country can be with their asylum criteria. But in the United States, generally, these are the criteria that are used. Number one, are you being persecuted based on one of those factors, race, religion, ethnic background? And have you been in the United States for less than one year? year. Now that's sort of critical, guys, because if you've already established yourself in the United States or otherwise are established in a different country, then you don't have as much reason for seeking asylum. It becomes essentially an afterthought. So generally, asylum is granted at the port of entry. So let's say you're coming up to the border in Texas. You could ask for asylum at the border, at that place of entry. It's also possible, even if you're an illegal immigrant, to ask for asylum within a year of entering the United States. And we can see where this might apply. This might apply if you, for example, came to the United States and everything was fine in your home country, but all of a sudden they're persecuting your religion. Let's say you were Muslim and there's another majority, let's say a Buddhist majority, that was persecuting the Muslim minority. You could seek asylum under that protection because they're persecuting your religion. So it's possible to apply even if you enter the US illegally. There are some limitations. If you've committed a serious non-political crime, that makes you ineligible. For example, if you committed murder, that would probably make you ineligible for asylum status. Also, if you were one of the folks who was persecuting others based on their nationality or religion, you are not allowed to seek asylum status. Only the victims are allowed to seek status, not the perpetrators. It's also a bar if you've committed an act of terrorism. This is something that's been hotly debated in countries across the world. What does that mean? For example, a political dissident could be viewed 
as a terrorist. And we can see this in many of the media brandings throughout various countries, where a particular dissident group could be labeled as a terrorist group or even placed on a watch list. But that might not necessarily mean that person has committed a violent act. As you can see, there's a lot of discretion country to country. Even within the asylum process, each country maintains its sovereignty. There's no hard check and balance if, for example, the United States says, you don't qualify for asylum status. If they turn you away at the border, let's say in Texas, there's no one to appeal to. There's no remedy. And that's true for much of immigration, because you have to understand, ultimately, each country controls its immigration policy. It has the sovereignty to enforce that policy. One of the other factors that has been major in the United States and has really, really been controversial politically in the last decade is temporary protected status. Now, temporary protected status goes hand in hand with asylum. Temporary protected status is supposed to be a temporary status that is granted to certain countries in the case of typically natural disasters or civil war. Typically, a natural disaster is cleaned up and typically a civil war ends. But the countries that are placed on this list are not always taken off. You've got countries like Somalia, which has been experiencing civil war for decades now and has been on the temporary protected status list since 1999. Yes, it could drink if it was a legal adult. But what does that mean for individuals? That means if your country was on temporary protected status and you happen to be in the United States, you have preferential treatment to be given asylum, to be treated as a refugee within this country. And this status has been granted to many countries, such as Nicaragua during the hurricane and Haiti during the earthquake. However, many of these countries were not removed from those lists. And that's been hotly debated between the political parties, whereas the Democrats generally would like to keep countries on that list and the Republicans would like to narrow that list. This is one of the huge things that everyone should look out for in Biden's first 100 days of his presidency. So it's critical that you check out my video, Biden's Big Changes, and understand exactly why Biden may change this policy in the first 100 days. But until then, I hope you've learned about asylum, and we'll see you next episode.